Present. Mr. Heckner. Here. Mr. Locke. Here. Mr. McGee. Here. Ms. Fargo Heckner. Here. Mr. Warren. Here. And Mr. Rinsky. Here. All present except Mr. Dietz. Thank you. Mr. Dietz is uh, working, as you know, he's involved with that backpack uh, project. I think that's this Saturday. So that's what he's, I think he's filling backpacks tonight or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. They do that Saturday, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now we'll go to approval of the minutes. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of August 1st? So moved. I'll second. Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Good. Courtesy of the floor, um, I have a few people signed up. First uh, on the list, I have Joseph O'Brien. You would just uh, repeat your name for the clerk. Yes, hello. I'm Joseph O'Brien from 5220 Vermont Drive in Easton, Pennsylvania. And as you might remember from two weeks ago, I'm here to address you again on the uh, Penn East pipeline. And I won't rehearse really what I said last time, except you know, perhaps just to summarize as saying, Obviously, the pipeline has little to no benefit whatsoever to the citizens of Northampton County on the one hand, but it comes with significant risks, you know, both to everything to personal safety, uh, to the environment, and quite frankly, to the quality of life uh, across this county. But, you know, what I really want to see, perhaps, and I you know, do recognize you've uh, just spent uh, some time uh, listening to the details of what goes on with Act 187. And I can tell you as someone who spent uh, the better part of the past week reading about reading Act 187, the great commentary on it, uh, that I can imagine just uh, how exciting this past few minutes have been. However, what I really wanted to talk about was maybe before introducing maybe some idea of what you could actually do and maybe why. Oh, you have five minutes. Uh, and I do. Yep, it'll be very quick. Just a little commentary maybe on sort of you know, responsibility in government and what happens with law. You know, and perhaps when we, you know, in the nation of laws that we have here today, you know, we have, of course, the letter of the law and the spirit of the law, and each have perhaps different responsibilities that they put on government, and particularly on its leadership. You know, if we think about perhaps the letter of the law, quite often it actually leads us to say that we don't have to take action, and that's usually a very good thing. We probably don't want government having to overly act in all sorts of areas. And in fact, if we look at everything from the, the Act 187, you know, the, the letter of the law, you know, right on through to you know, some of the recommendations that have been, have been created by working groups that have, uh, that have you know, talked about what is required to support pipeline development in Pennsylvania, that there's often much, not much really for local governments to do. And we have to acknowledge that. However, on the other hand, there's the spirit of the law. You know, these are spirits of the law that have gone from you know, the, you know, the Clean Water Act certainly Act 187, and, sir, and as well as, you know, say even here in Northampton County, the 2006 storm order ordinances that were, that were passed. You know, and these were areas really about protecting the citizenry and the environment that they live in, but really thinking about protecting the people. And what we have to understand in some ways is just as the letter of the law perhaps often leads us towards a conservative point of view where we don't want to take action, the spirit of the law often requires us, in fact, either to act within the law perhaps to interpret it in ways that we can actually use to support the goal, or sometimes to take the massive action of actually amending. And this is essentially what government has and what's in front of us here. You know, and what we can talk about right now are just you know, two, two types of ideas of things that can be done that in fact right now would in fact not stop the pipeline, but perhaps create the pause for the considered evaluation of it in light of the health and welfare of the citizens of Northampton County. So two things that could happen, and I'll quickly hit a third one. One would be around thinking about, uh, you know, essentially the earth disturbance area and amending the, the, uh, the storm order uh, ordinance of 2006 here in Northampton County to essentially say that, you know, no earth disturbance of greater than one acre except routine road maintenance shall be permitted in any portion of a watershed it, where earth disturbance of greater than one acre has taken place since the 2006 stormwater ordinance was enacted until and unless the 2006 stormwater ordinance for the watershed in question is superseded by a revised stormwater ordinance approved by DEP. What's this basically saying? Clearly the, the intent, the spirit of the law of, of Act 187 was for regular every five year detailed review and then changes. Why? Because there's development happens. Particularly if we think about the change that's happened here. I've lived in Northampton County since 2008. We now know that when it rains, it not only pours, we have floods. 
like, you know, clearly there has been an enormous change, in fact, to, you know, what we'd say, you know, technically as the earth disturbance that has taken place. This is something that could be done by this council, right, you know, in the next two weeks to put through to actually begin to change, well, what would be the playing rules for, for this pipeline? Similarly, we could talk about uh, adjusting uh, riparian buffer waivers, which have also been requested by the Penn East throughout the entire course of the pipeline area. But, you know, perhaps what is maybe even uh, more important here, you know, is thinking about the individual people involved. You know, because I think that sometimes gets lost in all this. You, know, you hear about environmentalism, you hear about maybe anti-business, no one wants to hear that. But we do want to think about the individuals. So one thing that you, know, you may not be aware of, so in the Code of Federal Regulation, this is Title 49, Subtitle B, Part 192, there is in fact um, a regulation that says that, that, to simplify, anyone, if there's a, di a disabled person within 1,000 feet of a pipeline, the pipeline has to use not Class 3, but Class 4 pipe. Now, we know, my wife and I, you know, within that 1,000 feet, just in our neighborhood, are two people who are in fact live in wheelchairs. The ability of the two of these disabled people to evacuate their homes in under a minute is not happening. And that's just who we happen to know from walking around our neighborhood and talking to the people we see. You know, what does this look like as we think about how this pipeline, which now goes through populated areas in a way that the pipeline just really have not in this state? And there are easy ways for, and again, a resolution the yep, council could 30 say, seconds. simply to, you know, for example, just to request from all the fire departments, who are the disabled people who have put their hands up to see just how many of these folks there are. I would argue the two lives is enough to at least pause and take, and, and take a, a considered view. So just in summary, you know, please, please consider the individual people here. Please not just think about the letter of the law, please think about the spirit of it. And I please hope that you'll all you know, find the courage to take massive action on behalf of the people of Northampton County. Thank you. Thank you. Can you just all repeat right. that code? I think the solicitor has it. You do? Got it. He has it. All right, thank you very much, sir. All right, next, I have, um, and I'm sorry because I, I'm having a difficult time. I'm going to say Artie Colon. Archie Colon. Uh, come on, if you just repeat your name for the clerk and you have five minutes. Yes, I'm Archie Colon, and um, I'm a county employee here. I'm employed by North, our Northampton County Pretrial Services. Been employed here since 1989, and I'm here in reference to resolution uh, 164 2018, which I believe is going to be voted on tonight in reference to our salaries. I'm just here to correct some facts, and I watched the video, the video yesterday from the personnel finance meeting, and there are a lot, a lot of misinformation in, in that meeting. Um, number one, uh, we we not once uh, came to the county and stated that we wanted to go step for step from our union scale step F or grade 25 step F to uh, the career service grade 25 step F or whatever step we happen to be on to translate into the career service scale. Mm -hmm. I've been here a long time. I know the history of what was going on initially beforehand. We were career service workers, not workers, but we were on the career service scale. And we transitioned into the union scale from that career service scale. So now, January 22nd, 2019, we're decertified from the union. Essentially, they walked away. They didn't. We were going to vote to be decertified. They walked away. We're decertified. As of January 22nd, 2019, we currently have no scale. So how are we being paid? And why, on August 15th of 2019, are we addressing this issue? Why wasn't this brought before your committee beforehand? We, and if it wasn't for myself and a few other members of our group, we would not be here today. We were told that we would handle this matter in 2020. Well, here we are being paid on a union scale that currently doesn't exist, and it's August 15th, 2019. And I'm here to answer any questions you have because I've been involved. I was the president of local 1040 for all the 14 or 15 years that we were a local here. So I've been through negotiations. I sat down with the county administrator. I sat down with Mr. Barron, Ms. Kelly. So if you have any questions whatsoever and what went on in those meetings, I'm here to answer any question you have. Pete was here for us yesterday. He wasn't equipped to answer the questions that he was asked yet because he never sat through any of the negotiations. I did. 
And I'm not, I didn't negotiate with these guys this year because we have no power to negotiate. We have no backing. But I approached them so at some point in time they would do what's fair. I'm here 30 years. I'm most likely going to retire next year if everything goes well. But for once in my life, I just want to see, for the first time, the county do the right thing. Thank you. Okay. I would say, I, if anybody has questions, we are going to be addressing this as a resolution. And I'll be here. Uh, for any of these people, maybe we should, we should hold off on any questions as opposed to getting in now, because I, I had a sense somebody wanted to get into a question now, because we have a few people on the list. No, I'm here for questions, because I've been through the process for forever. All right. Thank, thank you. you. All right, next on the list is, uh, I believe we have Chris Davis. If you would repeat your name for the clerk, you have five minutes. Yes, thank you, Chris Davis. Um, I want to piggyback off of what Mr. Cologne said. Um, I am a county employee. I work in an adult probation department. Next Tuesday will be my anniversary date of 29 completed years, and I will begin 30 years next Tuesday. I'm disappointed, to say the least, in what I believe was a, a lack of effort on the county's part. Um, we received the information uh, this week about the new pay scale will be put on, and all the pay scale is is our old pay scale, the one that Mr. Clone illustrated to you doesn't exist anymore. Someone took that and added two percent to it. There's no movement for growth um, or steps provided for someone in my situation. So in essence, what I'm receiving from this 2% is 64 cents per hour more than what I'm currently making, which doesn't buy me a cup of coffee. Um, and I'll be receiving that until I retire, it appears. And I just don't think that's right. And I, I agree with Mr. Cologne. I would like to see the county do the right thing. Um, in 1984, when I worked at a McDonald's flipping burgers as a junior in high school, after two years, I received a higher pay increase then than what the county is giving me now. After 29 years of service and four years at Lehigh University. I think that's disgraceful. And I'm disappointed in what I've seen, and I wish you would take that under consideration. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next I have uh, Tom Carlo. Carlo, if you'd come up and repeat your name, please. You have five minutes. Is this the handout? Oh, okay. Well, um, just before you start, um, I don't think I have enough of those for everybody. That's I okay. That's okay. You know what? Here you go. Um, I'll uh, give me one. I have this already. All right. Uh, go, I'm sorry. So go ahead and uh, read read your statement. Okay. You have five minutes. Okay. Tom Carlo. I'm a Penarjal resident. I'm also one of the founding members of Sludge Free Slate Belt and Sludge Free Penarjal. Uh, what I'm going to read is from Russell Zerbo. He's from the Clean Air Council. This was presented at the PADEP meeting regarding the air quality permit and the stormwater runoff permits for the proposed Cinegrove sludge drying plant in Plainfield Township. And it says, Cinegrove does not acknowledge in its application that Northampton County does not meet federal air pollution standards for ground level ozone and particulate matter. In counties that do not attain federal pollution standards, the limits on air pollution for proposed facilities are much lower. There are many problems with Cinegro's air pollution application. Within three miles of Grand Central Landfill, 25% of the population lives below the poverty level, qualifying the region as an environmental justice area under the state's guidelines. Given the proposed concentration of sewage and municipal waste activity in this already burdened community, DEP must consider the cumul cumulative impacts of this coordinated proposal between Waste Management, Cinegro, and the Green Knight Energy Center. In a proposed air permit posted on DEP's own website, Cinegro is proposing a 15 ton per year of PM10. 
and over 25 TPY of general PM, both of which should trigger prevention of significant deterioration thresholds in a county that does not attain PM standards like Northampton County. Senate Rose proposed 11.3 TPY of PM 2.5 above the new source revenue threshold of 10 P TPY. Senator Gross should be required to adhere to the new source revenue requirements for PM 2.5. Senator Gross goes as far as to include in this statement in its application particulate matter associated with paved and unpaved roads emissions were also included since roadway dust emissions are often concern a concern of landfill sites. Some of the most significant particulate matter emissions in this, propose, in this proposal are caused by emission from roads within the footprint of the facility. These are particularly significant given the nature of materials at the site, storage and municipal waste. Just as slate belt heat recovery may accept stormwater from the two adjacent facilities, dust from the two adjacent facilities may migrate. Sinegro even relies on the dust pollution controls from the Grand Central Sanitation Landfill. Sinegro claims Grand Central Sanitation Landfill's compliance history is irrelevant to the ND NPDES application, but later acknowledges that the facility's stormwater is subject to potential loading from co-located facilities, the so Green Knights and the Grand Central Landfill. SBHR sees stormwater Compliance directly hinges on the compliance of co-located facilities. Thus, the compliance history of those facilities is relevant to Sinegro's NPDES application. Grand Central Sanitary Landfill storage tanks also have a significant recent violation history. Sinegro operates a storage pellet pelletizer in Camden, New Jersey that has recent Clean Water Act violations. Senator Gross states in its application Excuse that me, Mr. Carlo, I, I don't, I, it's your five minutes. You can use it any way you want. Okay. I just want to let you know you have a minute left. If you want to, I mean, we can read this. If, if there's something okay. point you want to make, I didn't want to cut you uh, off in okay. the middle of reading. Uh, so you I have a minute here, left. We, I, I was here when we first learned about this about three years ago and talked to the county about it. I know there's not much you guys can probably do about it. This facility, they're going to bring in 400 tons of additional sewer sludge a day. They're already bringing in 10 to 15 trucks of sewer sludge into the, uh, the dump and mixing it with the garbage. They want to bring this in, pelletize it, and then they sell it for fertilizer. They don't know where they're going to get rid of it. They think they're going to use it for heat for cement places. They can't, they don't have find a place to do it yet. There's also a quarry pond there that they want to fill in another 100 feet of that they don't know how deep it is, they won't see how deep it is, and, and the town even says it's used to fill local wells. And stormwater runoff is going to go into that. It's going to go into the Waltz Creek, Little Bushkill Creek. Both of those are high quality creeks. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've partnered, not that we've partnered, but Delaware oh. Riverkeeper Network is helping us a lot. Sorry, your time, your time is up, but you certainly have the right to come back and address us again if you'd like. And we have, I'll well, make sure every council member gets the information that you gave us. All right, well, thank you very much, sir. Um, sorry about that alarm. I thought I said it softer. Uh, okay, is, I don't have any other names signed up. Is there anyone else who would like to come up and address council? Seeing no one, uh, we'll move on to the county executive report. Mr. McClure, do you have a report you'd like to give? I do, sir. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As you will recall, in preparation to begin negotiations with the MCOs, which are coming to Northampton County for Graysdale, we've had uh, an analysis performed with respect to our bargaining situation with the, with the new uh, MCOs. And during this process, it, it has really come home to us 
that when we discussed the moral obligation to keep Graysdale County owned during the referendum fight, um, it, wasn't, it wasn't overheated rhetoric. What do I mean? What I mean is we have discovered that in Northampton County, we have 44% of the Medicaid beds. In Graysdale, in Northampton County, we have 44% of the Medicaid beds. Graysdale is absolutely necessary uh, for the care of those folks. If Graysdale wasn't there and county owned, there would be a legitimate, and, and, and this isn't hyperbolic, a legitimate crisis of care for people who are on Medicaid. There's that. The other thing that we need to consider when we're, we're thinking of the 44% the Medicaid rate at Graysdale is we spend a lot of time, especially in human services committee meetings, on the oversight of Graysdale. And that's appropriate. And we do because we are as transparent as any county government has ever been, and specifically about Graysdale, air what some people might consider dirty laundry. And we do it on a fairly regular basis. But the context needs to be made clear over and over again that 44% of the Medicaid beds in Northampton County are at Graysdale, which means some of the pathologies and comorbidities that you find there um, with advanced Alzheimer's, dementia, Alzheimer's dementia in a schizophrenic setting, some of the numbers that we regularly see on our dashboard that are in the red, some of those numbers are going to be very very difficult to ever change, like the psychotropic medications, for example. Because with the psychotropic medications, you have to pick your poison. If you don't give someone who has Alzheimer's in a, in a schizophrenic setting their psychotropic, psychotropic medications, they're going to be violent with your staff folks. So there's this, this constant balancing of these, of these issues. So there's certain metrics. So when we're talking about these metrics over and over and over again in our meetings, we have to remember who the folks that we're, we're taking care of the sickest, with the, the sickest folks, and we don't turn anyone away. And that this is only be, going to become more so with the closure of the state hospitals. We just saw the state, in my, in my view, ill-advisedly is closing two of the uh, facilities um, that house the long-term uh, folks with uh, mental health conditions like mental retardation, what it used to be referred to as mental retardation, uh, the White Haven Center, uh, very near to us. We'll be, we'll be getting those folks, too. So that, for context, we have 44% of the Medicaid beds, and it's important for us when we're talking about that to keep that in mind. Um, we often hear council wastes its time with its resolutions that it sends in the air, sends it to Washington or Harrisburg or wherever it sends its resolutions. But I got a letter from Brad Roseberry, the guy who's leading the fight against big trucks. And we don't want any big trucks in Northampton County. And he wrote us a letter to let us know that because we pitched in with your resolution against big trucks, Congress, the big trucks legislation has stalled in Congress. So these big things we see on the road aren't going to get any bigger in the near term. So good job, County Council. Um, That's right. You're doing a terrific job uh, with the fiscal management of this county. Um, your foresight, as we discussed at the last meeting, allowed us to refund the most recent bond issue we did. Well, we're looking at the 2012 $60 million issue. And what we'd like to do is come to the Finance Committee meeting with a proposal uh, for the potential of refunding those 2012 bonds to save us almost $4 million, depending on market conditions. We haven't brought this to you before because no one could anticipate the Fed would reduce rates. They are. The reason I'm not proposing that we just outright do this to you and why I want to come in consultation and seek a resolution potentially from council is that it's a taxable event. And I philosophically am not wild about taxable events when it comes to a municipality because that's the cool thing about being a government. You don't have to pay taxes usually. Um, so that we're going to work together. We'll, uh, with Mr. Warner's permission, we'll be on the next Finance Committee agenda and we'll bring that forward to you. Mr. Heckman is always telling us we're not inviting you to stuff. So on September 9th, 
September 9th at noon, we'll be breaking ground on the new okay. forensic center. Uh, for those of you who are still confused about where that is, uh, we'll be, it's adjacent to the 911 center. So we look forward to seeing you there. Mr. Dertinger said everybody will get a shovel to use, and then it's going to go to the parks department. You don't get to take it home. Um, but uh, we're, we're, really, we're really looking forward to that. Um, I need to tell you about um, something that has occurred uh, with respect to our work release facility in West Easton. Because of a lawsuit uh, filed by the landlord there, he stopped paying West Easton the host fee, which is up to $50,000 a year. Um, as you know, West Easton is not a large borough. It doesn't have a great deal of money, and it never would have accepted uh, as willingly as it did the uh, corrections facility in its borough without that fee. Uh, we have agreed to take over paying that fee, up to $50,000, which was what the original agreement was. The lease with the landlord allows us to pay that and reduce it from the rent. So that's what we're doing. We're paying it. Mr. Executive, yes. but that wasn't when it was done. That host fee was not part of whatever legal agreement no, no, was made the, the, for him? Council, council, correct. It was not part of what council did. It was not oh. part of the action council took. Okay. It was part of the agreement between uh, the developer and the borough. Oh, okay. But the lease allows for the county to take that payment over if it chooses to okay. and reduce it from the rent. And uh, we can't be a good neighbor in West Easton and not pay that. So we've reduced it from oh. the rent. Okay. Uh, let's see what else. Have you noticed mellitus is coming down? Uh, it's 40%. 40%. What's 40? 40% 40 is basically what we get out of these um, bi-county arrangements that we have. Um, it's actually a little less than that. You know, it's about 39 and change with Lanta, 38 with the LVTS. Um, we have, I think, an unprecedented um, opportunity with uh, Lanta. Lanta needs to be reauthorized by March of 2022. It's uh, its articles incorporation and bylaws need to be updated. Um, there is the potential, and, and you may want to consider, I, I, I present this to you as a, as a notion for uh, your reflection that we enshrine that uh, whatever the particular relative populations are, we get at least 45% of those services, or, or whatever the relative populations are. I'm not suggesting that we don't pay for half of the, ha half of the freight, that, all of these arrangements are 50-50 after all. I would suggest they continue to be, except that um, we be guaranteed that with respect to Lanta, we get 45% of the services or whatever the two county populations are uh, at a minimum. So that's something you might want to consider as you consider the reauthorization of their bylaws. You, you have an unprecedented chance to make a difference in that regard. With respect to the Planning Commission and the Lehigh Valley Transportation Study, you know, we have also an opportunity here to use our leverage in terms of what we contribute uh, to the Planning Commission on an annual basis. Uh, I think you've all by now seen the uh, transportation funding on the most recent tip, and we are getting from here to 2045, from today to 2045, 28% of the funds, of the transportation funds, 28%. It's, it's time to utilize the leverage that we have to push back on this, on this funding disparity. Um, Go ahead, Mr. How do, how do we end up here, though? I mean, it seems to me that, you know, like if the administration took over and took office in 2016, and it was already a problem. Well, I have no ability to get into people's minds, but I have a working theory. And, and it goes something like this. Originally, when the uh, planning commission was established, it was a bi-county planning commission. And inherent in that, inherent in that establishment of the bi-county is that the county represents not only itself as an entity, a municipal entity, but all the municipalities. Somewhere along the way, that got lost. 
And so in my, with respect to my two immediate predecessors, it seemed to me, at least from the, uh, the emphasis that they had on particular infrastructure projects, which was our bridges, right? So Mr. Stofa wanted to tackle our bridges, and his plan was to do that by borrowing money, and uh, he did borrow the money, but unfortunately, he found that, you know, it, that, that project didn't work in part because the bridge building process is so slow and the bridges are so expensive. Um, so that particular aspect didn't work, but his entire focus was on our county assets, right? And there wasn't a larger engagement with the Planning Commission with respect to the municipal interests, right, and the needs of the municipality. So then Mr. Brown takes office. And he also identifies our bridges as a problem, and he goes down the P3 route, which we're all very familiar with and still living with today. Um, but again, it was a focus on just our bridges. And when this particular tip was voted on, he actually voted Northampton County's three votes in favor of this tip, the Transportation Improvement Program, which has us at this 28% level. I suspect uh, it was because his view was, which was not an unusual view for my predecessors, that the, what we really needed to take care of was our bridges. And I think they sort of lost sight of the overall, the overall goal here of the Planning Commission, which is we're responsible for our municipalities as well. Um, so I think, I think that answers your question, but. Yeah, no, that does. And I'm glad you brought up the P3 because you know, talking with the Lehigh Valley Planning Commission, I mean, that left a lot of money on the table that we could have had if it would have been in the funding, right? Yeah, it did. So that, like, it would have been funded right, with but, that but, money. But in fairness, let's be fair. Uh, let's okay. be fair. Let, let's be fair. The, it's incredibly hard to get a bridge on the tip. It's incredibly expensive, and it takes forever to get it done. And so the siren song of the P3 process, as, you know, PennDOT was implementing it, could have looked very attractive from a distance, but you know, look, PennDOT's got billions, right? PennDOT has serious heft. PennDOT can make you do stuff, right? What can, what can the GPA make you do? They're not doing anything right now, right? <laughs> they can't make Krieger do anything. So uh, it's, uh, okay. it's a completely different animal. Yeah, that does answer my question. Thank you. That concludes my report, sir. Thank you very yes, much. Yes, ma'am. Talking about the P3, the bridge, what's mm -hmm. the prognosis for my dear friends at the Grisville Academy? Uh, Mr. Mr. Dertinger has been working tirelessly uh, to uh, try and ameliorate the situation for them, including getting signage That's to, to indicate signage. That, that, that they're open. Unfortunately, right. Krieger messed that up, oh. that, but we'll get that right, and there'll be signage to indicate that they're open so that they're, hopefully their fall season isn't as impacted as, as their past season was. It's a great but, small but business. We can't make if them, anyone hasn't been there, please stop Mrs. it. Mrs. Farrar, really if you, you can add your voice to getting them to work and get that bridge done, that would be great. <laughs> Anything else from you? Thank you. Thank you. Hmm? No, I don't have any friends. <laughs> okay. I, uh, I have nothing on my agenda. I'd like to choke them right now. We ready? I have nothing on my agenda for all, under old business. Is there any old business to discuss? Seeing none. Anyone? We'll go to new business. Consideration of a personnel request resolution. Department of Human Services, Children, Youth, and Families. Mr. McGee, would you please introduce this? It is hereby resolved by Northampton County Council that one full time position of caseworker two, pay grade PS35, salary $40,255, shall be eliminated. And one full time position of caseworker three, pay grade PS37A. 1A, salary $44,341, shall be created in the Department of Human Services, Children, Youth, and Families Division, effective August 15, 2019. It is hereby further resolved by Northampton County yeah. Council that one full-time position of caseworker manager 2, pay grade HS 42B, 1A, salary of $56,386, shall be created in the Department of Human Services, Children, Youth, and Family Division, effective August 15, 2019. It is hereby further resolved by Northampton County Council that two full-time positions of caseworker supervisor, pay grade 
HS38B1A, salary of $47,284, shall be created in the Department of Human Services, Children, Youth, Family Division, effective August 15, 2019. And it is hereby further resolved by Northampton County Council that one full-time position of case worker three, pay grade PS37A1A, salary of $44,341, shall be created in the Department of Human Services, Children, Youth, and Family Division, effective August 15, 2019. So moved, Mr. Chairman. We had the committee meeting Very and uh, um, fully discussed that. And uh, actually, uh, the administration uh, presented it well, and um, everybody was uh, in support of it. Good. Any other further discussion? Seeing none, call for the vote. Mr. McGee. Yes. Ms. Bar uh, Mrs. Ferrara. Yes. Mr. Heckman. Yes. Mr. Lott. Yes. Ms. Barbo Heckman. Yes. Mr. Warner. Yes. Mr. Renski. Yes. And Mr. Kuzik. Yes. Adopted by a vote of 8 to 0. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, next, we have consideration of correction officers' interest arbitra arbitration award resolution. Mr. Mr. McGee, would you please introduce this? Sure. <clears throat> Whereas Northampton County Charter Section 202.12 provides that the County Council shall have the power and approve any collective bargaining agreements with officers and employees. Now, therefore, it is hereby resolved by the Northampton County Council that the Northampton County Corrections Officers Interest Arbitration Award between the County of Northampton and the Northampton County Corrections Officers shall be approved this 15th day of August 2019. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any discussion? It was in committee meeting yesterday. And it was um, presented by the administration and um, it went to mediation and we pretty much have to accept it. Okay. Uh, call for the vote. Mr. McGee. Yes. Mr. Heckman. Yes. Mr. Locke. Yes. Ms. Barbo Heckman. Yes. Mr. Warner. Yes. Mr. Renski. Yes. Mr. Kuzik. Yes. Mrs. Ferraro. Yes. Adopted by a vote of 8 to 0. Thank you. All right. Now we are going to go to the uh, consideration of revised Department of Human Services pay scale. It's a resolution. Mr. McGee. Whereas the Northampton County Council a Northampton County Council adopted resolution number 164, 2018, which adopted pay scales for certain full-time county employees, including 2018 Department of Human Service, Department of Human Services Civil Service non-union pay scale, and the 2018 PSSU pay scale. And whereas on August 6, 2019, the Department of Human Resources indicated due to the change in state maximum allowable salaries, it became necessary to revise the 2019 Human Services Civil Service Non-Union Pay Scale and the PSSU Pay Scale. Now, therefore, be it resolved by Northampton County Council that the Human Services Non-Union and PSSU Pay Scales shall be revised to read as indicated on the attached documents. Refer to Exhibit A. The above resolution was, was adopted by Northampton County. Okay, that's the yeah. bottom. Okay. okay, so moved. All right, thank you. Is there any discussion on the uh, pay scales, human services? Seeing see none, I'll call for the vote. Mr. McKay. Yes. Mr. Locke. Yes. Ms. Fargo Hefner. Yes. Mr. Warner. Yes. Mr. Rinsky. Yes. Mr. Kuzak. Yes. Mrs. Ferraro. Yes. Mr. Hefner. Yes. Adopted by a vote of 8 to 0. Thank you. All right, now we'll go to the consideration of revised court-appointed professional employees pay scales resolution. Uh, Mr. Uh, McGee, would you please introduce this? And you don't, you could just read the resolved. Okay. Now, therefore, it is hereby resolved by Northampton County Council that the 2019 pay scales and court-appointed professionals employees who are no longer represented by AFSCME local uh, 1040 shall be retroactive to July 28th, 2019 as referenced in Exhibit A, and shall be approved this 15th day of August 2019. So moved. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Mr. Cusick. Uh, Mr. President, uh, these folks here, they, they make up the backbone of, of, of the court system. I, you know, I know the judges get the big paychecks uh, and, and all the, the glamour, but without court reporters, without probation officers, uh, uh, our justice system here just wouldn't work. 
Um, so uh, I believe that based on everything that I've heard both yesterday and today that uh, this uh, pay uh, should be made retroactive to the beginning of the year. So at this time I'd like to uh, make an, a motion to amend this resolution uh, to delete the July 28th uh, date and replace that with January 1st. Uh, hold, hold, All right, he's making an amendment to the resolution. To, to change it. So I need a second. Before, I'm oh, oh, sorry. I got to ask you the question. Hello? You're, you're too quick. Yeah. All right. It has been moved and seconded. Uh, now that is open for discussion, the amendment, the, the, the amended, what, just the amendment. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, anyone what, want are, to? what are the implications of the amendment for the $16,982? Well, I think that was what was reported yesterday, somewhere in the $70,000 range. We would have to do a budget amendment yes. uh, at, at the next available uh, so opportunity. So a budget amendment would be contingent on this then. What if? No, they've, th they've budgeted it. for what they did. Right. So anything we say to do we'll to in any area, we, a budget amendment would have to be proper, or, or put forward. So we would have to then have a budget amendment and to move the 70 from the general fund, let's say, to this. Um, Ms. Ferraro, do you have any other question? No? Ms. Ferraro. This is a relatively small amount of money in the grand scheme of things, and I don't know, maybe it's the spirit of it again, but it's my opinion, and I'm sorry, but I strongly feel that these employees are being punished um, for leaving the union. I also feel that it's an affront to these loyal employees to to have um, this, to, n to not have it be retroactive. Um, and I hope uh, our members take off their union hat and put on their do what's right for our employees hat. Mr. Mr. Werner, then Mr. Lott. Um, in, in, light of the, in, in light of the comments that were made during our dis committee meetings and uh, talking about maybe some bad decisions, I believe that if people make bad decisions, that doesn't necessarily mean they should receive economic hardship because of a bad decision. And I, I believe that these, these, are, these uh, were reasonable requests, and I looked at the numbers. I don't believe the numbers are that big. I think we can afford to do we this, and I, I am going to be uh, for making sure that they try to get their money back. Okay, thank you. Mr. Lott. Yeah, um, you know, I've been on this council for a short time. It, it seems like every time that uh, a director or the administration comes to us and asks us for more money, the first thing we ask them is, why wasn't this brought up at budget? I mean, mm -hmm. that is always one, and it's a valuable, you know, important question to bring up. And I think we kind of covered why it seemed like Unfortunately, when the, this group of employees decertified it, it seemed from what I was trying to figure out was why wasn't there a game plan moving forward? And I don't know if I really got that answer yesterday, but um, it just seemed like, you know, a decision was made by this group of employees without much thought about, you know, how to move forward. And I, I really didn't get that answer. The, the next thing was the budget. Um, you know, we've always asked the administration, where are you going to get this money? Now, we are we're sitting up here and we're doubling what the administration has asked for. I mean, quite frankly, I've never seen that done before. I mean, we usually go the other way. Um, now, being this is, this is a tough one for me because I, uh, uh, you know, workers are something I value very much so and, and have spent my life fighting for, for the rights of workers. I, I was just very confused about uh, the thought process that went into this. I mean, everybody has a right to choose if they want to be union or not, but you also have a right as an employee to make sure that your decisions are good decisions. If you're gonna if you're gonna get rid of your bargaining group, I would have thought we would have had you know a, a, a game plan coming into this thing where we would have saw it at budget time, um, it, 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 and we we didn't see that, and and that that's what my concern is. I mean. I don't know about doubling what the administration is asking for. It, I, I think I, and I, I'm not positive about this, but I, I feel like, you know, there was decisions made without a lot of thought process on, on, on timing of these decisions. 
You know, maybe the timing could have been better to roll this thing over. Um, so that, that's why I'm, I'm going along, along with the suggestion of the administration on this. Um, I just have not been explained to, this is the first we're hearing about it. It's midway through our season. Um, so Lord, I will Lord. be voting against the amendment. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, Ms. Hefner and then Ms. Ritzke. I heard most of this yesterday. It was difficult to hear some people speaking, but I did make some calls today to get some information about the timeline and how this unfolded. And my understanding, again, if somebody wants to answer a question, is that this was, this was the date that was determined. And so I don't know why, if it wasn't asked to be retroactive, why we're arbitrarily deciding, oh, let's be, let's be nice and let's be fair to these people. It's not about that. We have we heard time and time again, why wasn't this done in a budget amendment? My other concern is I've been on both sides of the union seat. I've been a union member. I've not been. I've been an at-will employee. If you ask for 2% and they say no, they say no, and you don't get it. And you don't get a raise sometime for years and years and years. So it seems like this is the best reasonable offer the administration made. I don't really understand the history of why people are or are not in the union. Now is not the time to bring that up. That's probably been discussed. But I have a concern about going against what was originally decided and determined. And can I ask, is Liz Cal can I ask? Were they involved? Ms. Kelly, would you come to the podium? Because again, it was difficult to hear some of it yesterday. We were in the rain, but were, were there negotiations made or this was a determination by the administration in lieu of the fact that they were no longer in the union? Well, it, to call them negotiations wouldn't be accurate okay. because the only negotiations we can have with employees are the ones pursuant to Act 195, um, which is the Pennsylvania Public Employee Relations Act. Um, when they decertified, they lost any right to engage in collective bargaining. Uh, and they did decertify. The order was issued January 22nd. We, myself, uh, Steve Barron, didn't do anything. We had no obligation to bargain. Uh, we were eventually contacted by I can think of two employees. One was Mr. Cologne, who was here um, sitting behind me, and another one was Mr. Eisenhart. I don't know if he's here tonight or not. Um, we met with a group of employees, maybe six or seven. It was myself, Mr. Barron, Kathleen McNeil Wedge, who's my deputy director, uh, and Ruth uh, Vega Velez, who's deputy court administrator. We invited Mr. Green, but he uh, designated Ms. Vega Belez to attend. Um, we told them we agreed to meet with them because we'd be willing to listen to whatever they wanted to tell us, okay? And they wanted to talk about pay increases. And it is a clear memory of mine that the pay increase that was communicated to me was that they all thought they should be on the career service pay scale at the same grade and step that they are or were on their most recent court professional employee pay scale. So if they were on CP grade 25 step 9I, they thought they should be on CS grade 25 step 9I. We costed that out. And the cost of moving everyone in that former bargaining unit to the corresponding grade and step on career service was $356,000 in rough numbers. Um, we didn't discuss any percentage increases or anything. What was communicated to us was that they thought they should be on the career service scale. Um, when we found out the cost of moving everyone to the corresponding grade and step on the career service scale, it was easy to see that that wasn't really going to be feasible. Um, it was expensive. It was more than we had negotiated with any other employee group. It was more than, more than I know that any employee of the county got in any single year. So we on our own, and our own would be Mr. Barron, uh, Ms. Wedge, and I, Ms. Vargo, or uh, Ms. Vega-Velez really 
uh, didn't seem to want to be much involved after the first meeting. We bet and we came up with fallback plans and we costed out our fallback plans. Um, much as, like you said, any employer would do. If you're contemplating whether to give an increase or not, if you're contemplating, um, you know, what you're going to do with these employees going forward who are no longer in a bargaining unit, um, we did think, well, okay, what would we have to do to move them to the career service pay scale? We costed out one scenario where we'd move them to the closest possible step, which might not be the same number grade and number step they're on, but it would be the closest to the amount of money they're getting. That was not good because it would result in uneven pay increases. Everyone would get an increase. Some would get $9 for the year. Some would get like 3000 So we didn't like that. It was inequitable. And it still had a cost. It still was going to cost 50000 just to make the adjustment. Um, we looked at another scenario where we'd move them to the closest step, closest plus or minus. So some people would actually lose a little bit of money under that. And again, the losses and wins were uneven. We didn't like it. It was still going to cost $20,000 for a year to make that adjustment. Can, can I interject something here? Yes. We are at present discussing the amendment, which is really about changing the date of, of when we're doing this, not okay. the actual pay scale. Yeah. And I think. Oh, I'm well, sorry. I, I, I mean, well, I asked about the. I asked I mean, about was there a negotiation, and I just wanted to know the timeline because the question that I have is, we're talking about making it retroactive. Here it says July 28th. So I guess my one single question is, did the group involved say we want retroactive? Was that a request made by that group? Uh, I don't think they used the word retroactive, but they certainly made it known that they wanted this increase to pick up where their collective bargaining agreement left off, and they wanted to be move to this career service scale the day after the day after the contract expired was really my understanding not necessarily the day it was decertified okay. and we never talked about a two percent increase with the group that was something we came up when we saw that this pay adjustment to move them to career service wasn't going to be easy or smooth or cost free okay right. i guess i my concern is also, I hear what Mrs. Farrow said about take your union hat off. Well, I don't have one, but I am concerned that we have a lot of unions that bar did bargain in good faith, and they got, and they lost, and they gained, and they lost. And so I don't know the history about how these people are no longer in the union, but right now that's the choice that and was made. Yeah. And so sometimes we live with our choices. And so I'm really conflicted as to how to vote on this. Was there someone else who wanted to speak? Ms. Well, Cernsky. Did you have a question? Years, no, I uh, just wanted to make a comment. Oh, no. So um, I will yield to uh, Mr. Cologne. Do you have a question for Mr. Cologne? I do not, but I, he says that he has something to say, and I'd like to hear it. I do. I do. Uh, I, all right. I, I don't generally. Chair, well, all I right. Generally, like, but this is a this is a this is an employee need. situation, and I've always been pretty flexible on anything we do with our employees. Right. But generally, if you here, want somebody so from the audience to have a question. Have but Mr. Cologne, what did you want to we say? We understood that we lost. And I just like you to keep it we, we understood that. When yeah. we decertified, we understood that. But I approached the court, court administrators last year around September 2018 mm -hmm. to inform them that it is a possibility that in 2019 we're not no longer going to be part of that union. I, I just can't understand how it becomes our burden, the employee's burden, once we're decertified, to have a plan. Have a plan. That's the county's responsibility at that point. January 22nd, 2019, we're no longer part of the union. Mm -hmm. It deflects back to the county administrators here. We initially came from that career service scale, which we're qualified to be on that scale. That's how it, that scale came to be. And I've been here a long, long time, so I understand the scale. We have job descriptions. We have qualifications. That's how they place us on whatever step on that career service scale initially before we became part of the union. So here we are. And then the burden goes back to us, the employees. 
I approached county administration last year. They knew this was possibly going to happen. And here we are, January 22nd, it goes by. Let, it's let, let me ask you a question. Are you upset? I mean, I understand well how, from the administration's point of view, because right. we don't negotiate. And, and, we and we're not going to, we, gonna, we, I, we don't meeting. get involved with the unions, right. and right. nor should we. It doesn't matter to me why you were in or why you were right. out. Right. The thing is, um, are you objecting to the pay scale that was come, put together? My objection is that that pay scale no longer exists. Well, and they took 2%. Well, and they created it because you're, you're in a unique situation. Without any background right. in doing so. So did you expect that no, you were going to end uh, your unionization? Correct. And then go directly back to what it was 10 years ago, go back on career what services? We were. Why, why, did, why were you led to believe that? Well, we weren't. Or led what to led you to we, believe that? We actually approached the administrators here, and we asked them for a fair resolution. Mm -hmm. So for them to come here and say that we, we want to go from step 25F to step 25F from the union scale to the career, is false. I'm sorry. Right. We Mr. Didn't Lott? Yes. Um, so what I understand when, when you're not in a union in the county, mm -hmm. the administration sets the wages. No, we do. We set the wages. But there's qualifications. We approve, we approve them. Right? But there's qualifications why you're being paid what you're being paid. We're required. That we, we approve, right? Yeah. Correct. I mean, they're putting it. So the, the but, point but, I'm getting at is, any other time, the non-union employees of ours, our great non-union employees, whenever we approve it, we approve what the administration is. It standard procedure for us to, you know, to, to go against what the administration and add more to the employees? Are we, is that, I mean, because uh, uh, they're not just dealing yeah. with this small group of people. Yeah, but my We're contention is a, that. A large employee. And are we undermining our administration? No, we, no. we, we, we are non-union employees currently. That's my contention. We're no longer union employees. Currently, we're being paid like we're union employees yeah. from a scale that no longer exists. It's not here. And, and, and if I could answer Mr. Lott's question, uh, uh, specifically at budget time, the administration makes a proposal, and council can choose whether to accept that or not. And for example, a couple of years ago, there was a pro proposal, I believe it was, for like a 2% raise, and what council did instead of that was to give a step for more senior employees. So there's an example where, where council has uh, made a decision um, that was different from the proposal from the administration. And our intention was to get back and get this ball moving. We didn't want to be in La La Land, and that's where we are right now. Mr. We Rich, came. I understand you weren't finished with your question. No, I, I wasn't. Um, but it, it's it's bothersome to me that I mean I'm not a, a union employee. Correct. I've never been a union employee. Okay. I, I haven't been able to be a union employee. I was full commission, I'm a contingent employee, I'm salaried hourly, I've done that all. Mm -hmm. I've never thought that when I go and ask for a raise or a pay scale that's, it's go that I'm gonna get what I want. Correct. And I'm not, I'm not saying that. I asked the question yesterday, is this a reasonable request? The amount is $69,982. It's not a whole lot of money. Mm -hmm. You're all gonna get an extra 800 Whatever it is. Dollars. Mm -hmm. I don't think that this is punitive. The two percent that went across the board is the raise that everybody got. So when you think of the grand scheme of fairness, right? Mm -hmm. You want a four and a half percent raise when everybody else, other uh, all the other county employees got a different. We thing. never said that. No. Honestly, we never said that. We wanted to be placed on our scale, closest to where we're at. But I don't understand what led you to believe that leaving the union would allow you to do that. But what, at what point in time are we responsible for that? We're no longer part of the union. It's the county's responsibility at that point to place us in a proper pay grade. And what led you to believe, to think that that would be the pay grade that they'd put you in? That's where we came from. It doesn't matter where you came from. There's justification to be on that scale. The bar sand study back in 1992 placed us on that scale. That's where we were because of our qualifications. Well, you Mr. said that you came to him in September. 
or you came to the administration in September of 2018, right? No, I'm going to, uh, hold on, hold on, hold on, everybody. No. I'm going to just call a halt for a second here. Um, and it was my discretion to certainly have an employee come up. Sure. Right now, I, you know, we're having a lot of discussion about the pay scale, pay scale, pay scale. Mr. Kuzik has an, a, a resolution or amendment that was seconded on the floor that says, do we want to amend this? Because then we're going to vote on this as a whole. So we're not even right. talking about voting on this now. Do you want to move it from the effective date of 728 to, now are you using a pay scale? You said the first of the year, Mr. Kuzik. You're not setting it as per when they were decertified. And, and that, that's, that's, he wants to set it for January 1st. Re reason being is that that's where all of the career service employees receive the 2% raise, and also it's when the contract expired uh, w w that they had previously had with AFSCME. Okay, now. And there's also another issue, and real brief, um, the non-union employees currently receive 48 hours of personal time. We still have not even gotten that. All right, well. And there's, there's not a monetary issue involved in that. Okay. And that was from January, the first paycheck right. in January. So here but, we are. All right, Ms. Ferraro. But no, I just think it's, it's just not fair to have them out there in limbo while the other employees from January to whenever, July or whatever. It's not fair to have these folks out in limbo. It's only fair that they are treated the same as other career service employees. And that's what we are. All right, well, I'm going to... And what they are. My position, I, I, I think, is uh, th we have the pay scale, which is one issue, and this is the issue of going back. Um, and the union, I, I don't know why the July date... I mean, once you were decertified in 122.19, mm -hmm. for all intents and purposes, you became wards of the county. That is correct. Uh, now... Having said that, though, you did have a pay scale, so I'm not going to address the pay scale. And the county had to come up with, well, what do we do? Mm -hmm. We're going to put them here, but they were in a union, and I, I would imagine it was a messy business, mm -hmm. not just for you, but for the administration and the folks trying to put together, how do we handle this right. since you decertified after the budget was approved, let me finish, and, and the, the, the beginning of the year. So now the July, and I know when I was here yesterday and questioning um, Ms. Kelly, uh, about the July 28th date, and I really didn't get a sense of a, a strong reason why it was July 28th, other than that's just when we decided to do it. Because frankly, you really aren't in a position, once you became wards of the county, you're not really, there's no one who to, can negotiate for you. I mean, she can sit, or anybody, I could sit with four people if I were still an administrator, but that doesn't mean anything because I, there's no representation. You have no representation anymore. So from, from my perspective, just on this alone, I, I have to be inclined to, to go back because I do believe that you, in fact, became our wards effective in January. So on that point, and on that point alone, uh, I, I would concur that, because I don't understand the 728 date, and, and that's, maybe that's me, and I, I'll take that. But over the years, I should remind council, and you gotta look at the charter, I'm not suggesting you do it, but we are the people who actually do set the salaries. Now, I wouldn't say go in and tinker, and uh, the executive probably got before he has a heart attack. I would, Please, I would say you, you're making a big mistake to go in and tinker with pay scales or anything like that. But this is a specific instance of a specific situation, and I don't know if we'll ever see it again. I mean, I never, I never saw a decertification, and I, wouldn't, I would have been in the same boat the administration was trying to put this together. I really would have had a tough time agreeing to the pay scale you were talking about. But having said that, on the date thing, I have to lean towards the time that I think you became part of the, the counties, you became under the counties, Bailiwick, and not the unions. As to the decision you made or didn't make or the, count, or the union made, I'm not involved in that. I don't want to be involved in that. It's not really council's thing. We don't negotiate. So I just wanted to be clear where I stand on this um, and, and on this specific part of the issue because we have two issues here. When do we do it and what do we give them? So this is the when do we do it. So does anyone have anything else they want to say or discuss? Okay, well on the well, rest. I do. Oh, Mr. McGee, go right ahead. 
I do. Um, we talked about it a lot yesterday, and I appreciate the employees getting engaged. And you know, it's it's a big deal. It's their it's their livelihood, and it's their paycheck. They told me this was going to be a hard job on council, and it is a hard job tonight. And some nights you don't know what they, what what to vote for or how to vote, and you try to collect all the facts. The administration handed us a fair deal yesterday. It was a fair deal, and the way they presented it, I looked it over a couple of different times, and. Um, you know, I thought it was very fair. Mr. Kusick said about, you know, this, this is our bright group. I mean, they probation officers to whatever else, you know, the court services that you do, and, and that's important too. But I'm going to have to side with, uh, <clears throat> with Kevin Lott, and uh, I think the August, August date is the right date, and uh, that's where July I'm at with it. July 28th date. July 28th date. Okay. Um, all right, is there any, if there's no other discussion, I'm going to call for the vote on the amendment to change the date only, not the pay scale. Call the, if you would call the roll, Ms. Simbo. Mr. Kuzik. Yes. Mrs. Ferrara. Yes. Mr. Warner. Yes. Ms. Zerinsky. No. Mr. Heckman. Yes. Mr. Lott. No. Mr. McGee. No. Ms. Fargo Hefner. No. Four to four. The amendment fails on a vote of four to four. All right, now we will move to the pay scale itself as it was originally written. Um, that has already been introduced. So, yeah, so now we're ready to go right into the discussion on the pay scale. Is there any discussion on the pay scale as it's presented to council? Seeing none, call for the vote. Mr. McGee. Yes. Ms. Fargo Hefner. Yes. Mr. Warner. No. Ms. Zerinsky. Yes. Mr. Kuzik. No. Mrs. Ferrara. No. Mr. Heckman. Yes. Mr. Lott. Yes. Adopted by vote of five to three. All right. Now, having done that, I believe that's the last thing that we have on our agenda. Is there any other new business from anyone on council? Seeing none, we'll go to committee reports. Any committee reports? We were all at the environment, energy, environment, and land use committee. I was. Oh, you weren't. Did, you could tell did me you later. Uh, we'll we'll give you a briefing. I'll be fine. Thank you. We discussed a lot. Okay, that's it. Uh, um. All right. Any other committee reports? Say none. Liaison. No liaison. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Bill. Go ahead. Planning Commission. They're probably go they're going to be coming in before council on uh, September 5th, and uh, for about 15 minutes, and then they're going to leave some time for questions. As uh, as we all know, if re reading the newspapers, um, there's there's some huge funding cuts coming to the Lehigh Valley on transportation they're they're going to carve out and just do the lehigh valley planning commission regional plan that time they're going to have to set another date to to do the transportation um commission as well and uh i i, I just think that uh these cuts are, are bad news for us and it's going to be a lot of work on the administration's plate to to try to weed through it and and get the best deal for the county and so mr chair Yes. I'd, I'd, if I don't, if I can comment on, we've been talking for years about the Lehigh Valley Planning Commission and all their their wonderful plans they've come out over the last ten years of how to handle traffic in the Lehigh Valley, how they're going to handle the warehouses, and to no avail. Now we're looking at three hundred eighty-five million dollar hole. Okay, mm -hmm. I don't think another committee is going to make it better, and I don't think having any of their reports is going to help. I think we need some help from upstairs. At a, at a higher level, so I'm going to recommend we go to a, a state or federal level. Well, I thought you were talking about <laughs> a higher <laughs> level, yeah. But we are, we're not right. getting anywhere. I've seen. <laughs> I, they they probably spent more money on those reports that they put out to show us how well they're doing. That that we had uh, to this day. I watched the traffic on Route 22 and 70, which was supposed to take the, the pressure off 22. Of course, the warehouses took care of that. So, uh, and now we're talking about the road deterioration. So. I'm w interested in hearing what they have to say. Again. They'll be here. So uh, write your questions I just, down. I just wanted you to know that I won't be a friendly. It's the fire. next. It's going to be next meeting. full council. 
Mr. Hackman. All right. It's going to be September. Fun. Yes, Thank they're you. coming. Have your questions um, ready. And, and to comment on your comment, the roads are terrible. They're getting worse, and they're pushing a lot of the funding towards the interstates yes. because they're getting the heat from the feds, federal government, to to shore up the the interstates. So that takes a lot away from our our roads that we travel in every day. So that's that concludes. You know, just one thing, Bill. I asked Becky Bradley a while back why we can't ask those large companies to fund some of those roads and deteriorating problem. And I never got a response, but I'll be ready to ask that question again this time. Anything else? Okay. That's it. Thank you. Council Clerk's report? Nothing. Council Solicitor? Nothing. Seeing that, ask for a motion to adjourn. Made, second, we're out of here. Thank you. I'll get to you tomorrow or next day on that. Yes, committee. I want you to hear this.